today that the Lord has made us rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome you to the worship here at West Hampton Presbyterian today. It's a delight to see you and to uh, worship God together. I hope that it is a special day and we're serving brunch afterwards. And you will feel free to remain with us. Uh, there's always enough and we enjoy the fellowship and it's we are especially blessed with your company, but also with the company of uh, Richard Williams, whom I will uh, introduce in just a moment. I also want to highlight this week as special. It's the inaugural recital this coming Thursday at 7 o'clock, and it's right here in this sanctuary of Will Roselock. Will, we're excited. We're looking forward to it, and uh, thank you for your leadership and, and for coming on board and getting me down and running. Thank you so much. Come, bring a friend, 7 o'clock this Thursday evening. Also today, our first graders have been preparing for their participation in the Lord's Supper today. Um, Mrs. Duke and Mrs. Carter have been um, preparing, teaching their class, and uh, they are ready to come forward, I believe, and present their the elements. Is, are they ready, Mrs. Carter? Just about. Well, let's go on and make a couple other announcements, and then we will. They will be the. There are a lot of other announcements in the bulletin. I think they all speak for themselves. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about our work, our world communion speaker today. Uh, Richard Williams is a graduate of the Colorado School of Mines. How he got from there to the Farming Seminary is only a story that uh, an engineer turned pastor and church leader to tell. Uh, maybe you could ask him about that. Richard is the director of the Young Adult Volunteer Program in the Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, he coordinates uh, the ministries of young people who decide they'd like to give a year, sometimes more, of their, their lives for service in the church. So he'll be speaking in more detail, in more detail about that uh, after the service in the parish hall. He's um, married to Mamie. Is Mamie here? There she is. Reverend Mamie Brockhurst and their daughter Nora. I'm looking for you. And uh, thank you for making the long trip from Louisville, Kentucky to join us for this special day. We're delighted you're here and now we're delighted that you were able to find an egg in the chicken coop this morning. That was also pretty special. Um, Richard and I go back to a class though, a particular class called Poets in Faith. It had not been a very good session. We were reading a poem by Lee Young Lee, a, uh, a Korean American poet on discrimination, which sparked a very, very tense and not so productive classroom conversation about racism in America. Well, um, everyone gathered themselves uh, after that rather disappointing class session, and uh, a week or so later, Richard and Kate Lloyd Jones, uh, the, an African American woman student, came to me and said they would like to do their project together on how seminarians can address the issue. Do you remember that? I said, this guy is the keeper. <laughs> I also said that about K. Boyd Jones. Uh, there, your project, uh, whether it was ever published or not, it should have been. I know it got you an A in the class. And, uh, helped us turn the corner on some very important uh, and critical issues that we face as people uh, from uh, every culture and every planet. So Richard, uh, thanks for uh, coming this far distance. We look forward to your message. And uh, those of the rest of you, please welcome Richard and Mamie and Nora and make them feel good. Now, I'd like to uh, ask our first graders who've been preparing for communion to come forward to present the gifts and I will receive them. 
are ready and bold enough to declare our sinfulness, God hears us and responds in grace and a new life. Sisters and brothers, join me in the prayer of confession. Holy God, dear of peace, Father of truth, we confess that we are divided and at odds with one another. A bad spirit has risen among us and set up against your Holy Spirit of peace and love. Take on us in the shadows, heart of spirit, compassion, and all the evil that
say when we have a special guest? Can you help that? Can you help me to say welcome? Let's try it. Let's try one, two, three. Welcome. We have a special guest today. He used to be one of my students. Does he look like one of my students? <laughs> Let's see if we can get to know him, and he's here with his family, so I'm going to ask Reverend Williams to introduce his family in a little more detail. Yeah, my name is Reverend Williams, and like Chuck, you know, Pastor Chuck said, uh, Chuck was my teacher, uh, so it's great. If you can imagine going and working with one of your teachers someday, it's a great honor to be here with Pastor Chuck, and I'm also here with my family, and that's my wife is also a pastor, Reverend Mamie, and that's my little girl, Laura. <laughs> Tell us about the kind of work you do and what you do um, for the church. Yeah, today is such a special day because I know that we often think of our church like right here as church. But you know the great thing about being a member of the church is we are part of a family that stretches all across the world. And so today, all of those people in our family, all across the world, are going to do the same thing. We're going to have the same meal together. And I get to work with a program that sends people out to that big, wide family all across the world to celebrate what God is doing all across this world. When you get a chance to work with young people, what, are, what excites you and what do you see happening in the lives of the young people that you're working with? Well, I love working with young people just like you all, because I can see that some of you all have a lot of energy, right? I get to work with people maybe just a little bit older than you all, maybe when you're, when you're 19, maybe when you're going to college or just out of college. And these are folks that want to go and see what God is doing around the world. And just like you all, they have a lot of energy. And it's fun to send them out and see, to see what God is doing all around this world. So if I had to say one thing, it would be lots of energy. Boys and girls, do you have any questions for Reverend Williams? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Reverend William, where are some of the places that you send these people full of energy? <laughs> so we send people out to different places around this world, and this last year we had people that are serving in the Philippines, which is about as far away from here as I think you can get. And we also have people that are serving in Peru, and in Colombia, and in Northern Ireland, and in South Korea, and in Zambia. And we also have a lot of people that stay in the U.S., in our own country, to work on uh, serving God here in the U.S. And they serve in 15 different cities across the U.S. as well. So if you like adventure, or you like traveling, or exploring new cultures, there's a place for you to serve. <laughs> Reverend Williams, one other question. Where did you serve as a volunteer? When I went out, I went to serve in the Philippines, which is literally on the other side of the world, and it was a great time. And I think there might be somebody else who served in the Yenville Volunteer Program. Is there? <laughs>
special day in the life of the church for bringing together people from all over the world to unite at the table. We thank you for world communion. We thank you for this particular congregation, sensitive and alive, joyful and open to the your leading. Help us in every way to be the disciples of Jesus. Amen. I think some of you are staying. I think it's pretty step the plan. They are first graders. Uh, first graders stay, but everyone else. Second grade. On up. Down. The children's trip. Right. And um, pre-K and kindergarten. Pre-K. Okay. All right. Take off, guys. Thank you.
We also pause to remember in this and many lands of abundance, there's still so many with great need. There are those in hospitals who long for healing. There are those in shelters who long for safety. May your church be moved with compassion for all. And may we who gather here give generously. May we have the vision to help the hungry. May we have the vision and commitment to provide opportunities for children to grow in safety. May we have the vision and commitment to give order and help alleviate suffering amongst the elderly. May we open doors of opportunity for those who feel as though opportunities have passed them by. For those who are rebuilding their lives today, help us be partners in that reconstruction. May we join all those, as in St. Paul, who forgot what in forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, we press on. We press on toward the goal of the prize of heavenly calling Christ Jesus. Hear us in all our prayers and now let us hear you as together we pray the prayer Christ teaches by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As part of our offering today, I have to call on Lenny Beale to bring us some information about the in the world that divide us. They exist among the nations, in our communities, throughout congregations, in the midst of households across the globe, and within ourselves. Through these dividers, we as God's children become broken. Paul's letter to the Ephesians describes peace as a spiritual bonding agent holding us together through the love of Christ. It restores our fractured pieces to a whole, creating a connection between us. Through this, we experience the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is Peacemaking Sunday, as well as World Communion Sunday, and the Peacemaking Offering funds the Presbyterian Peacemaking Program enabling us to bring in international speakers, as we have the past couple of years, hold conferences, and advocates for active, nonviolent solutions to conflict. The Presbyterian Church views peace as a core part of our identity and calling us as believers. It is, it is a central declaration of the gospel, calling us to model our lives in the pattern of the sense of peace of Jesus Christ. This year, our mission committee, small but strong and very hands-on, would like to donate our 25%, our church's 25% of the peacemaking offering, to Doctors Without Borders in their fight against the Ebola virus in Senegal, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Doctors Without Borders provides medical care to people in nearly 70 countries worldwide saving lives threatened by violence, neglect, or catastrophe. As a humanitarian organization, they treat people in crisis regardless of race, religion, or political affiliation. Because Ebola is highly contagious, staff treating patients suffer from the disease must wear protective equipment to prevent transmission. I'm sure you've all seen this on your TV screen. Ebola first appeared in 1976 in simultaneous outbreaks in Nazara, Sudan, 
in Mount Bukwin, DRC. The latter was in a village situated near the Ebola River. That's where the disease takes its name. Fruit bats are considered to be the natural host of the Ebola virus. The case fatality rate varies from 25 to 90 percent, depending on the strain. If contracted, Ebola is one of the world's most deadly diseases. It is a highly infectious virus that can kill up to 90% of the people who catch it, causing terror among infected communities. Doctors Without Borders has treated hundreds of people with the Ebola disease and helped to contain numerous life-threatening and numerous life-threatening epidemics. Since the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was officially declared on March 22nd in Guinea, it has claimed 2,461 lives. That was the figure last week. The outbreak is the largest ever and is now raging unabated. Five countries are currently affected. Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Senegal. Ebola can be caught from both humans and animals. It is transmitted through close contact with blood secretions or other bodily fluids. Healthcare workers have fre frequently been infected while treating Ebola patients. This has occurred through close contact when they haven't used gloves, masks, masks or protective goggles. Stu and Marilyn Wood received updates from their family in Dakar, Senegal. We all pray for the health of Randy, Erica, and their children. Please use the envelopes in your bulletin and support our Doctors Without Borders. I also want to invite you and encourage you to attend our luncheon immediately following worship in our new and beautiful parish hall where we can hear more about Reverend Richard Williams and his exciting young adult volunteer program. Let us give our thanks.
God, we thank you for the chance to make a difference in the world, and we pray that this offering, these are offerings, will do that, bringing healing where there is disease, hope for where there is despair, love where there is hate, and renewal for all of creation. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
and into something different. Past our daily bread, our daily need, and into our daily want. We move today from hunger as a reality to hunger as a metaphor. Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament scholar, has an essay entitled The Liturgy of Abundance, The Myth of Scarcity. Now that title just about says it all, but if you read through the rest of the piece, he paints a story of the first book of the Hebrew Bible as a liturgy of God's abundance, beginning with and reveling in the abundant story of God's creation in Genesis 1, verdant and fruitful, generous and just. But at the end of Genesis, Pharaoh introduces the first concept of scarcity into this creation, speaking of famine in the land. The descent into Egypt and the fall into slavery and the eventual exodus are all responses to this myth of scarcity, a myth that is so common and so central that it's often the only reality we can know, or can even imagine. The story of manna in the wilderness is a reintroduction of God's people to this liturgy of abundance that has been the fertile soil for every story in Genesis. As Reuben says, it is God's love trickling down in the form of bread. They had never before received bread as a free gift that they couldn't control predict, plan for, or own. It's a wonder, it's a miracle, it's an embarrassment, it's irrational, but God's abundance transcends the market economy. Abundance, miraculous, embarrassing, generous provision. Friends, this is how God cares for each of us. I get to work with a program that often makes this abundance provision transparent. I work with the Young Adult Volunteer Program, the ministry of the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church USA, that sends young adults into a year of faith-based service at 15 sites around the United States and at six sites around the world. These young adults tackle some of our world's hardest, longest-lasting, most complicated problems. And they do it alongside local leaders as invited guests to help see in how local communities are responding to homelessness and hunger and conflict, isolation, broken educational systems amidst many, many other problems. These young adults do this service in a community of others in service, sharing in their faith and their growth, their challenges and their struggles all together trying to figure out how and where God is at work in this world. The tagline for the YAS program is a year of service for a lifetime of change. And that is something that we hope each one of our participate, participants is a part of. Both a year of transformative service, but more than that. A plunge into exploring service with others as a lifetime problem. Taking this year in service and intentional living and formation is something that every bit of our culture tells them is a waste of time, a diversion from a career path, an indulgence before getting on with the real things in life. But I believe that this year is where they will find God's abundance. Not only in gathering those skills and connections and experience that will launch them to what is next, but also in finding a place to trust in God's abundance, to find what is truly needed in this life, and to counter that myth of scarcity that so haunts all of us. For them, as for all of us, it's not an easy time. The idea that believing that God is faithful is a hard one to place all your trust in. One of the core tenets of this crazy year that the young adults I work with have signed on for is to practice simple living, believing that we can best find God's abundance when we stand against the materialism that surrounds us. 
That's a message that sounds good in a sermon. But it's a much harder method to live out for a year or for a life. In this week's story, when the people cry out, and our text says that they are a rabble, and I just love that small detail in our text, because that is so much what we are. We're a rabble. When this rabble cries out, it points straight at what Brueggemann says. We confess that the central problem of our lives is that we are torn apart by the conflict between our attraction of the good news of God's abundance and the power of our belief in scarcity. This scarcity is the lack that is so prevalent in our world today. A lack of basic resources, of opportunities, of dignity. But it's also our not being satisfied with enough, even as we are surrounded by so much. It is our curse of insatiable desire. This struggle between God's abundance and our belief in the world's scarcity, it is a central struggle, a good struggle, and it can occupy a whole year of a young adult struggling. It can occupy all of our lives, just as it occupies much of the Hebrew Bible, and the teachings of Jesus, and of Paul, and of all of our churches ever since. And I believe that you all are a part of that struggle that this ministry is of all Presbyterians, of our connected and wider church. We all get to play a part in caring for God's people, by taking our own place in the liturgy of God's abundance that we proclaim in our own lives and in this world that so desperately needs to hear it. This central tension between God's abundance and our own fear of scarcity is not only for those who choose a year away, it is all of our struggle. But our text today in Numbers goes just one step further, past, uh, past the story of manna and into this strange story of the tent, of the sharing of God's spirit. And while it may seem distant or disconnected, these two stories sitting side by side of the people complaining and of God's sharing of the spirit have made me think about the connection of living abundantly particularly in a world full of want, and the sharing of God's Spirit, to how God leads God's people. After hearing the Hebrew people's complaints and their reflexive reliance on this myth of scarcity, God points Moses toward a way ahead, a way to break the deep habits of long imprisonment in Egypt. God calls on Moses to gather the elders of the people, and to bring them together for this sharing of God's very self. Gathering God's people and raising them up as leaders is a way for us, too, to break our bondage to the myth of scarcity, to participate fully in God's liturgy of abundance. At its heart, this year for the young adults that I work with will be about gathering together, learning and experiencing God's spirit and going out to lead God's people in that spirit. They'll be joining with agencies and ministries that are finding where God is at work in this world and sharing God's provision with those who are in physical hunger and those for whom the metaphor of hunger is also too real and debilitating and deathly. They will be joining with people outside, clamoring outside the palace gates for God's kingdom come. And they'll also be joining with people who are within the halls of power, working for a crumb of God's justice, for policies and laws that are just a bit closer to God's will. We've seen in the past 20 years of the AF program how this sharing of God's spirit plays out, how young adults through service find God calling them to be a part of what God is already doing in this world. We've sent over 1,500 young adults on this journey, me and myself or two of them. And this year we have 90 young adults serving in the sites all around the world. They're all growing and understanding more of what God is calling them to be and how God is calling them to take an active part in God's transformation of this world. Those 
those folks who are serving, their stories of service and are incredible and moving. And I encourage you to, to, to listen to what they're saying. But to me, one of the most interesting and exciting parts I see is what happens after a year of service. When folks have discerned what God is calling them to do with their whole life. About a third of yes will go on to seminary and ordain ministry in our church. But the other two-thirds also stay in God's service. They're working in social service and help in education and nonprofit work. They are literally changing the church and changing our world. They're out gathering men, enough for everyone, enough for all. And each of you, through this year with these young adults, have a part to play. Raising up new and faithful and strong leaders is our church's ultimate sustainability initiative. The liturgical capstone of living into God's abundance. It's not easy or costless, but it is a way that places our trust in God to carry us forward. Whether we are lost and confused or wandering people in the desert, or whether we are lost and confused for watering people here in West Hampton. We are called in each generation to trust in the new and surprising things God is doing among us and to raise up new leaders to pass on that trust. Friends, just as the Hebrew people did long ago, we have a chance now to trust in God's abundance and provision in our lives for our children and all those that will come after us. Or we can fall into the myth of scarcity that this world proclaims. The myth of the Pharaoh. The myth that there is not enough. That leadership is limited. Resources scarce. That God will not provide. I hope we all choose wisely. Amen. Friends, it is a joyful feast to the people of God. They will be coming from all over, from the east and the west and the north and the south. They will come because Christ is our host. He awaits you and me and all our neighbors. Come, come, come and take part.
here in the West Hampton Presbyterian Church. All of our welcome. It is our practice to wait until all of them serve the men to come as one on the invitation. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God. For you called upon your hands, and your, all your hands have rocked and called it good. You smile upon purple mountains soaring above wildflower plains, where grasses rise to meet their, to, with their backs to meet your spirit. You sent clouds scuttling across reflective waters and set stars to wink upon the earth and the deep, knowing the light. You call the tune for the dolphins dancing in the play of the waves, as giraffes amble across savannas, birds sing in full-throated graves, and children of various hues giggle as they run free in your bed. Despite your creative goodness, we use our freedom for ourselves alone, without regard for your intentions for us all. Still, you chase after us and save us from sin's harm, freeing us from slavery to give us a new world, flowing with milk and honey. When we chase after other gods, you call us back to you, through the cries of the prophets which we ignore, until at this last you sent your own child to be for us the goodness we were to Therefore, we praise you. Joining our voices with the choir of creation and all the saints of all the times and places who forever sing to the glory of your holy name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, and the earth of holy glory, for the God and the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, for the God and the highest. Blessed are you, O Christ, for coming to us as a little child to live that pious in the muck of our fallen world, embodying God's desire to bless all people, who spoke peace to a war-mongering world, and were blessed to be a blessing to all people, and threatened with the terror of crucifixion, who did not keep silent, but stood up with resurrection to new life, and to turn the bread of human affliction into manna from heaven. Turn the bitter dread of sin into the cup of joyful celebration. As we await your coming among us in the fullness of your sovereign glory, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Praise be to you, O Holy Spirit, blowing through time to enliven your people, the church, to live as Christ's body and God's ministry of repairing a broken world. Come hold cover over us now with your bright, brooding dreams and the breaking of bread and the celebration of this cup, that our eyes may be open to recognize Christ among us and in all who share in this feast, knit in us more closely, knit us more closely together in the fellowship of your sovereign way. We offer our lives, our resources to be in your hands. Reaching into the world, with your unfathomable compassion, fill us like breath that fills flutes to the instruments of your peace. Amen. The mighty was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Whenever you eat this, do so remember me. same way after dinner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant, a new pact between you and God, that they all may live and have eternal life.
hungry, anyone believing in me will never thirst. Take me, all of you.
are doing and join up the cause. Take a hand. Serve one another. Go knowing that God who created you, redeemed you, and sustained you will go with you this day and every day.